With everything that has transpired over these past couple of weeks surrounding Ryzen 9000 Zen 5 reviews, it's gotten me a bit more interested in Intel's upcoming Air Lake CPUs and architecture, and I'm not personally expecting a huge leap in performance, but this iteration does seem like it's going to be paving the way for Team Blue's comeback in the CPU world. At the same time, I wanted to discuss what the implications are for Zen 5 failing. Let's discuss that in this video. This video is sponsored by SCD Keys, so you just recently built a gaming PC and are looking to get Windows installed and activated. While SCD CD Keys has got you covered. Over on their website, they offer great deals on various software and games. Right now, you can buy a Windows 11 Pro OEM key for just under $25. Simply click on the link in the video description, use promo code DRSK when checking out, and get 25% off, much cheaper than if you were buying directly. Then once you have your key, you're going to want to open your Windows 11 settings menu. On the left search bar, type in activation settings, then you'll want to click on change product key. Enter in your key and you'll have an activated copy of Windows, it's that simple. You can also use this code to purchase a copy of Windows 10 and also Microsoft Office, a program I use on a daily basis. Thanks to SCD Keys for sponsoring this video, check them out in the video description. Hey what is going on guys, Danny here, welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. Today I wanted to talk to you guys about Ryzen 9000 series and their underwhelming performance for desktop users and why this turnout isn't something that's good for the future of this market. Aside from the obvious reasons of course, like who wants to hear about a new series that comes out and then it's barely faster than the last. Nobody does. But aside from that, just learning about the bad performance, this does also have some negative implications on the market which may not be apparent at this time to consumers, but they will have to bear it in the future. Along with that, I wanted to talk Talk about Intel's upcoming Air Lake desktop processors as there's been some recent leaks surrounding their lineup as well as some performance benchmark leaks. Starting off with AMD, we've recently on the channel talked about the performance of the 9700X and 9600X as those reviews came out earlier due to the earlier launch dates and overall they were very disappointing for desktop users. Aside from some niche AVX 512 workloads and some AI applications, you're not going to be seeing any tangible benefits over Zen 4 parts which will offer the user much better value for your dollar. Then we never really got a chance to talk about the 9950X and 9900X review as those came out later but honestly we don't really have much to say because the story basically repeats itself with those parts as well. Hardware Unboxed had a pretty good comparison segment at the end of their 9950X review. That means on average across our productivity benchmarks the 7950X is 52% faster than the 5950X. Meanwhile the 9950X was on average just 3% faster than the 7950X. Yep, 3%. Let that sink in. Again, aside from those niche use cases mentioned before, buying Zen 5 makes no sense at all for the general consumer. Let's use the 9900X for example. Currently it's selling for about $500 on Amazon, where for that same money you can get a Ryzen 9 7950X which will perform better in almost all the desktop productivity applications, and gaming performance between the two would be a wash. If you know what you're doing when it comes to tuning hardware, you can buy a 13900K for a bit less than that at $470, and it trades blows with the 7950X and 9950X, and offers for similar gaming performance or if not better. Or you can just buy a 7900X, get that same performance and save nearly $150, which you can then put towards something like a better GPU. I think we finally figured out AMD's strategy here guys. So they come out with a new generation of products which, depending on how you look at it, aren't terrible but then they price them way too egregiously, get crap reviews initially which in turn makes their last gen sell like hotcakes again, cause you know there were probably some folks who had held off purchases to wait for Zen 5, then once Zen 4 is cleared they drop the new gen to the prices they should have launched that and then rinse and repeat. Doesn't really seem like a sustainable strategy to me, but hey, if you talk to anyone on an AMD thread or forum and they're like, yeah, Ryzen 7000 is way better value for the money, just get that. Either way, it's money into AMD's pocket, right? But jokes aside, this complacent behavior is exactly what we mocked Intel for this past decade, and the way AMD is behaving now isn't really all that much different. When Intel had no competition, what were they doing? They were feeding the general consumer a quad core with some minor IPC and clock speed bumps with each successive generation. They remained complacent and were able to do this due to the fact that they had no competition. And it wasn't until AMD launched Ryzen 1000 in 2017 where they finally were met with some fierce competition. Now AMD's situation isn't identical because unlike the early years of the 2010s where AMD couldn't even touch Intel aside from some budget parts, Intel is still right there with them. They're trailing right behind them. You can see in various benchmarks from gaming and productivity, Intel has performance. It's just that due to Intel fumbling their timeline with fabs and their CPUs out of the box running 
something so poorly tuned in Power Hungry, it's deterred a lot of people to AMD in the DIY market. But if you look at benchmarks, you'll find a $240 13600K is offering similar gaming performance to a 9700X while also giving it a good run for its money when it comes to multi-threading. And this is an i5 which is supposed to be competing with a Ryzen 5, but the tiers don't really match from AMD's side. If there was any better time to shake things up in their lineup, it should have definitely been now and AMD should have finally taken the time to shift their SKUs downward where they could have given the consumer a 6 core Ryzen 3 for less than $200, the Ryzen 5s should have been an 8 core for around $250, the Ryzen 7 should have been a 12 core and then the Ryzen 9 could have remained a 16 core but the prices should have been much lower as well. By doing this, they could have garnered a lot more attraction to their Zen 5 CPUs because while the architecture didn't really bring the performance gains that were anticipated by many consumers, at least shifting core and thread counts, the comparisons would have looked a lot better because then reviewers would have compared an 8 core Ryzen 5 9600X to a 6 core Ryzen 5 7600X. Then this would have also made the messaging more clear that Zen 5 was a series aimed towards AI and HPC and then X3D gamers could have been its own separate thing. But by doing this, they would have kept the pressure firm on Intel, who are already going through a world of trouble dealing with their instability problems, along with the internal management problems. But now AMD's given Intel a much needed break. They've given them that headroom they were looking for, they've left the goalpost wide open with no defenders. And now Intel may not be so incentivized in giving their best offers to consumers with Air Lake, and if the performance is a lot better than Zen 5 and Raptor Lake in gaming, you can bet they will charge a nice premium for them. But I'm not really expecting a giant leap from Air Lake when it comes to raw performance, and well, neither should you. Air Lake to me seems like in a way it's Intel sort of resetting their position in the market. Given what we know about Air Lake, about how Intel will be using a new manufacturing node, they're getting rid of hyper threading, and they're lowering clock speeds, it does seem like they'll be prioritizing efficiency, which in my eyes is a good thing. And for those wondering, well, why did I bash Zen 5 if I do care about efficiency? Well, Zen 5 wasn't actually all that more efficient than Zen 4 was. Gamers Nexus on their channel had a pretty good deep dive of this. With that said, I already thought that Zen 4 was already quite efficient, and if Intel can get to that same sort of level in efficiency, but also offer better performance, or if it's just slightly better, then I see that as a win. I think Arrow Lake will do well in gaming. I'm expecting overall it should be about 10% faster despite the lower clock speeds. In multi-core workloads, I can see them trading blows with Raptor Lake, but if they do so at like half the power, then that would make them pretty good. Since we're on the topic of Arrow Lake, there were some leaks which recently surfaced online that basically confirmed the entire Core Ultra 200 lineup from Intel, along with specs such as core counts and frequencies. So you can see how core counts are pretty much the same as Raptor Lake's parts, but what changes is that hyper threading has been dropped. I've seen a lot of mixed reception about this. I, for one thing, it is a better move, having physical cores rather than logical cores, especially if those physical cores come with larger IPC gains, will make up for the difference there. When it comes to gaming, Hyperthreading doesn't really make a huge difference anyways. This was something I tested last year using 40 games on my 13900K, and in fact I found in a lot of games they performed a bit better and gave smoother 1% lows without hyperthreading. There is some regression in clock speeds though, so that will have a bit of a negative impact on gaming performance, but if the difference in clock speeds is like 5% and we get a 15% boost in IPC from Lion Cove, P cores, this should still result in a pretty decent performance boost. And remember, the Skymont E cores are also also getting a pretty hefty IPC boost and are getting a small bump in clock speeds, so that's why Intel seems confident in getting rid of hyperthreading, as those E cores can make up for that difference which was lost. From what I've heard, the SkyMod E cores are basically on par with Raptor Lake's P cores, and if you have 16 of them, then yeah, that's gonna be a big help. Now, for those of you who are still doubtful, and that's okay, remember, take all this speculation with a grain of salt, but what can maybe help put your mind to, at ease is that we have had some leaks of the 20 core Ultra 7 265KF which by the way is a stupid name. This is supposed to be the successor to the i7-14700K. But anyways, this leaked result is from Geekbench 6, posted by video cards, and you can see how in single thread it is slightly faster than a 14900K, not by much, 3%, and then in the multi-core part of the benchmark, it does lose, and that would make sense since this is a 20-core part versus the 14900K, which is a 24-core part, but with hyper-threading. So the fact that the Ultra 7 265KF managed to offer 93% of the 14900K's performance in multi-core with lower cores and without hyper-threading is, well, pretty impressive. There was also another leak showing the Core Ultra 5 245K in Geekbench 5, and you can see now it's about 11% faster in single-threaded performance compared to a 14600K, and while
while the two parts have similar core counts, the 14600K has hyper-threading on the P-cores, but despite that, the Ultra 5 245K manages to pull ahead by 5% in the multi-core score. And as I was editing this video, there was another leak of the flagship Ultra 9 285K showing a 10% performance improvement in both single-thread and multi-thread compared to an i9 14900K. So those results should tell you that with those E-cores, they have gotten a pretty hefty boost in performance. Without hyper-threading, I think Arrow Lake will be just fine. By setting up the core and thread count this way, it will help them with their focus on efficiency because hyper-threading does increase power usage by quite a bit, which in turn leads to more heat. The other thing I wanted to talk about that I think many of the mainstream outlets overlook is how much better will the memory controller on Arrow Lake be compared to Raptor Lake? And will motherboards also be improved where users, even on a 4 dim board, can easily run frequencies north of 8,000 mega transfers? I ran a poll on my channel asking those in my audience who have 13th and 14th gen Intel processors and are running DDR5, what frequency are they running and found that the vast majority of users are running frequencies at or below 7200 mega transfers. This isn't surprising to see though because above 7200 mega transfers, it does become quite challenging to attain those higher speeds, especially if you are on a 4 dim board. It's one of those reasons why I got an Apex Encore for my personal system, and with a bit of luck in the Silicon Lottery, I was able to get a chip that can run 8000 mega transfers with decent timings. And that does help the processor stretch its legs in various applications, and also gaming. So with Air Lake, if we see that 8000 mega transfers RAM is more easily attainable for the vast majority of users, along with those CAM memory configurations becoming more accessible, that will definitely put Air Lake in a good light when it comes to benchmarks. So this is why I'm really interested in Air Lake, because because it does have a lot going for it, not necessarily in terms of a huge performance boost, but just from an architectural standpoint, the big IPC uplifts and e-cores, a stronger memory controller, as well as tackling their efficiency problem, which leads to stability in CPUs for users. Whereas with Zen 5, it doesn't really feel like AMD did much for the general consumer. This is also why I mentioned how Zen 5 failing sucks, because now Intel has that green light to jack up prices once they feel like they have the edge again. But with some pressure from having competition, this would have maybe started a price war and having a price war is always good for the consumer but that's going to wrap it up for this one according to rumors Arrow Lake is expected to launch sometime in mid-october so we'll see what happens then we'll touch base in the next video if you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining then leave a like let me know your thoughts and comments down below be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel such as using my amazon affiliate link and if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching, take care and I'll see you in the next one.